webinar this morning. Do stay with us uh, until the end as uh, we will have a quiz session where the participants may win four tickets to Fire India Discovery Wetlands. And uh, please note that this webinar is at, uh, will be recorded. Uh, the recording is on. So uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available uh, and we will send the link to all of the participants. Now, um, uh, I think we have uh, more participants are coming in. So let's uh, take a little bit of time. So for those who just join us, good morning and, wa and we welcome you to this webinar. We are just about to start. Okay, so before we start the webinar, there are some ground rules which we would like you to observe. First, please mute your mic. And secondly, please switch off your webcam. If you wish to ask a question in between the presentation, please use the chat box for any inquiry. Then the moderator, which is me, will direct the questions to the speakers during the question and answer session. Lastly, the organizer will try our very best to stay within the program uh, time frame. So now I would like to take you go through the program of the day. So we are now actually at the welcoming session. Um, we will then follow by three presentations. After the presentation, we will then open for question and answer session. As a reminder, please use the chat box to raise your question. Lastly, it would be the most exciting session where the participant may stand a chance to win four tickets to buy in the Discovery Wetlands by answering the questions correctly. Yeah? Okay, now I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, Dato Paduga Kezru Abdullah. Dato Kezru is the chairperson of Council of Wetlands International Malaysia. So he has been involved in the field of water and water resources uh, engineering for the past 37 years. He graduated in civil engineering from the University of Malaya and joined the Department of Irrigation and Drainage Malaysia where over an illustrious uh, career, he rose to become the Director General. Um, during his time as the Director General, Dato Kezru has pushed for a more environmental friendly approach to solving water issue uh, and advocate the need to manage water, river, flood, and coastal problem in a holistic and integrated manner. So after his retirement uh, from the public service, Dato Kezuru continues to accept invitations to share his knowledge and experience on issues related to the green technology, the environment, professional engineering, and water-related natural disasters issue. This is when he joined Wetlands International and continued his advocation for the wise use and management of water resources. So, um, Dr. Kezru, the floor is yours now. Thank you, May. Um, and a very good morning to all our participants. Um, I would like to share with you some information about wetlands. Now, but first I've got to get into my screen. Well, they say there's always problems when we are dealing with computers. Okay, here we are. All right, so uh, I'd like to start with a short commercial. I'm from Wetlands International, and some of you may not know who we are. So Wetlands International is a global not-for-profit organization dedicated to maintaining and restoring wetlands. We are very concerned about the rapid loss and deterioration of wetlands. And we want to safeguard and restore wetlands because they are vital for our water security, biodiversity, and generally for human well-being. We do have a network of offices around the world. But I'd like to start off my presentation with a question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word wetlands? So, Typically, uh, a layman would have this picture of a typical wetlands, which, uh, and the word that comes to mind would be swamp. Right? So uh, it's a swamp, it's full of mosquitoes, it's full of leeches, there are snakes in it, and sometimes there are even crocodiles. 
So it's a pretty dangerous place to be in. And it's seen as useless land, wasteland. Uh, even the Malay word for wetlands is tanah lembab. Right? You know, when, when uh, somebody is slow, we say budak tu lembab sangat. Uh, but actually, God gave us wetlands which in its natural pristine condition really beautifies the landscape. And these wetlands are the home for plants. Uh, we have various species of mangroves. We have trees that can grow to very tall. At the same time, we have shrubs. And we even have trees which can grow into a forest. Right? So we also see some very unique uh, species of trees with, with their root systems, which comes out in a very unique way. Right? So this, this wetlands is home to a vast variety of flora and fauna. Um, we even have uh, the, the Siamese fighting fish. Um, it's endemic to a swarm in, in Johor. And also the wetlands, the coastal areas are considered wetlands where you can have dugong feeding on the seagrass. We have frogs. And of course, if we have frogs, we have insects. So we have butterflies, we have dragonflies. And you know, if you look at the life cycle of the dragonfly, the adult dragonfly lays its eggs in water. It hatches out into nim, and when it grows, then it will crawl out from the water and turn into a butterfly. So very similar to the mosquito um, life cycle. Uh, the only difference is the mosquito feeds on our blood, whereas the dragonfly is a very good indicator on the quality of the water because it will only lay eggs if the water quality is good. Right. We have also a very unusual, uh, unusual animal or marine life, uh, which is the mangrove uh, horseshoe crab. I call this the royalty of marine life. You know, when we use the word royalty, we, we talk of blue-blooded people. And actually, the Belanka, the blood is blue in color. Unfortunately, Post Malaysia wants to make it into an exotic food. So what are wetlands? Wetlands are defined under the Ramsar Convention as areas of peatlands, water, whether it's natural or artificial, whether it's permanent or temporary. And it includes even marine water up to six meters depth. In short, wetlands are land that are covered with water, either seasonally or permanently. So what are the type of wetlands that we can find in Malaysia. We divide it into three categories. The first category, we looked at the marine and the coastal zone, and this includes coral reefs, beaches, mangroves, uh, and seagrass. So in terms of coral reef, we are very rich in coral reef. Uh, in terms of mangroves, we have the second largest area of mangroves in Southeast Asia. We have lots of sandy beaches and we also have rocky shores. The second category looks at inland or fresh water. And under this category, we have rivers and going all the way down to freshwater springs. So in Malaysia, we have 189 major river basins and they are all considered as wetlands, all the rivers. Uh, we have, uh, we have two, almost two and a half million hectares of peatlands. We have huge areas of Nipa. Um, and the third category are what we call man-made wetlands. So under this category, if we construct a dam, we create a reservoir, and the reservoir is considered as wetlands. So this is the Duran, uh, Duran Tunga Reservoir in Malacca. Uh, when, when we convert land for agriculture, then it becomes wetlands. Paddy fields are considered as wetlands. Um, this is a good example of a constructed pond, uh, which we work together with Gamuda land to put into Gamuda gardens. And we have all heard about Putrajaya Wetland Park. So why do we want to conserve wetlands? What's so important about it? 
In essence, wetlands provide us with a lot of ecosystem services, ranging from coastal protection uh, down to water purification and to tourism and recreation. Let's look at what benefits society gets from wetlands. First, wetlands are a source of food. Um, our staple food is rice, and as I said earlier, rice fields are considered as wetlands. Secondly, they are a source of other natural products. We get, for example, gula melaka from nipa trees, and we have berembang juice. And then wetlands are also a source of livelihood. Uh, we, we have inland fishermen who depend on the wetlands for their catch. Wetlands are also a source of water for us. 98% um, of the water that comes to our house is actually sourced from the rivers. 2% comes from underground water. Wetlands protect us from water disasters because it acts as a front line and it reduces the force of the wave. And for urban areas, if we construct retention ponds, we will then be able to store part of the flood waters into these ponds. So it protects us from floods. And wetlands also contributes to tourism and recreational activities. Uh, this is a quick uh, commercial on Paya Indah Discovery Wetlands, which you will hear more about after this. Um, in effect, urban wetlands bring nature back to our concrete jungle. Uh, besides giving benefits to society, wetlands also provide benefits to the natural ecosystem. Wetlands provide an ideal environment for flora and fauna. It supports a rich diversity of flora and fauna. Um, and it also supports some unique species. For example, the proboscis monkey can only be found in the island of Borneo. For Malaysia, it's found in the Kinabatangan River Basin in Sabah. Wetlands provide a nursery for marine life. So the fishes, a lot of the fish, uh, fishes that we catch in the seas in fact, their nurseries are in the wetlands. It's a source of food for water birds and also for frogs. You know, we, we have a species of frogs who love to eat crabs. And of course, after they have grown big, then they become food for other species uh, in the food chain. Right, so wetlands provide shelter and nesting for the birds. And it's also a resting stop for migratory birds. Every year during winter, birds will migrate from the north to the south. And some species of birds migrating from Russia would stop for rest in Malaysia before proceeding to Australia. Uh, this picture is taken in Sitiawan in the Korean irrigation project. Unfortunately, over the past few decades, much of our wetlands are becoming endangered. Right? So they are faced with many threats. First, they have the threat of tsunamis. Uh, you will re remember in the 2004 tsunami, um, the whole of Aceh was really wiped out. And a lot of the mangrove forests were destroyed by the tsunami, essentially because they are, they are in the front line. And so they are the first to bear the full force of the tsunami. Secondly, they face threats from storms. When we have storms, the waves become very high and then it will cause erosion along our coastline. Thirdly, we have uh, threats from pollution. In a lot of uh, our wetlands, we are seeing a lot of plastic pollution and also water pollution in the lakes and ponds. Uh, even from oil, uh, you can see in, in, our, in our cities, sometimes we have oil which is thrown out, discharged from workshops, and then it goes into the drains, and from the drain, it goes into the rivers. Uh, on the coastal area along the Straits of Malacca, we have a lot of ships, and occasionally they would discharge some of their ballast water, which is oily. 
But the biggest threat to wetlands comes from land development. We are converting our wetlands to agriculture. Uh, we are putting agriculture into our floodplains and we are creating aquaculture ponds into our coastal wetlands. And then lately, uh, over the past 20 years, forest fires has become a big problem because the peatlands during droughts, they, they become very dry and then they will be susceptible to peat fires. And you remember whenever there is these huge peat fires, we will get the haze over here. And if you look at this picture, um, this person is wearing a face mask. So we were wearing face masks even before COVID-19 became a problem for us. And lastly, the bigger uh, the threat to wetlands would come from climate change because in climate change storms are going to be more severe so we can expect more erosion of our coastline we will have more and more extreme events the floods and the droughts and we will also be suffering from sea level rise so if you look at these threats tsunami is really nature it's a natural disaster so are storms but pollution, land development, forest fires, and to a large extent, climate change, these are all from human activities. A study done by Wetlands International uh, finds that almost three quarter of the threats to wetlands are coming from human activities. Yet we know wetlands are the cradle of life uh, and without wetlands, in fact, if we look back, early civilization started along wetlands. Uh, and we have seen how wetlands provide us with benefits and functions. It provides us with food. It supports us in terms of our habitat. It regulates, it helps to regulate the climate. And it has also got a cultural uh, aspect to it. But they are all under threat in Malaysia. They are under very serious threat. So we need to now start to talk about saving our wetlands. And this was the theme for World Wetlands Day last year. Uh, World Wetlands Day falls on February 2nd of the year. And last year, it was found that we do need to start to, to create momentum to save our wetlands. So what can we do to save our wetlands? Well, we must get involved and we can do this by joining programs that help to protect and restore wetlands. Um, we have programs where we have awareness programs for the children. Uh, we, have, uh, we can have family orientated programs so we can do tree replanting with our family and with our colleagues. Uh, we can also explore the wetlands so that we can understand more about what they give to society. We can help to clean up the wetlands, the beaches, the lakes, and the rivers, and the forests. And we can, we should do our part to try to send this message to our friends and our families and to our colleagues and to put it into social media platforms. Right. So if we are alone, there is not much we can do. But if we all come together and work together, we can then do so much and then we can then protect and we can save our wetlands. So with that, I do wish all our participants would from, from this uh, webinar would then come forward and work together with Wetlands International, with Kamuda Parks, and also with Paya in the Discovery Wetlands. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato. Um, thank you for highlighting the hidden treasures in Malaysia. So we have now learned that Malaysia is actually housing so many types of wetlands. And these wetlands occur not only along the coastal or rural setting, but they actually also exist in the urban setting, they exist around us. We have learned also that wetlands deliver so many ecosystem services, including protecting us from storm and provide us with food. Um, 
I would like to take this opportunity actually to welcome uh, some of the participants who just joined us. Um, as a reminder, please mute your mic and switch off your webcam. So if you have any question, please use the chat box function to post your question. We will answer these questions during the Q&A session after the, the, the presentation. So now I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Christine Fletcher. So Dr. Christine is an ecologist. She has over 17 years of research experience in the field of biodiversity conservation and management, ecology and geology with the Forest Research Institute Malaysia, FRIM. So her research focuses on the conservation and management of wildlife in the production forest, and she managed a few stations, a uh, few research stations that conduct long-term studies to understand the natural and the human-induced impact on plants and animals. She also spent uh, several years in a consulting firm working with engineers, developers, and planners in preparing the wildlife management plan and the environmentally friendly development plans to reduce the human and animal conflict on roads and also some of the development area. Um, she, her advocation for the urban biodiversity is actually in line with the national policy on the biodiversity and the new urban agenda, which is supported in the UN SDG, the UN Sustainable Development Goals to build a better environment and quality of life. So since early of this year, February of 2020, she was appointed as, that, as an advisor to the Gamuda Corps to assist in implementing the biodiversity policy and provide input to address the emerging issues related to the biodiversity and the environment. So now, Dr. Christine, uh, the floor is yours now. Right, thank you, May. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is pretty much um, the biodiversity survey that I had conducted for Gamuda Parks um, at Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. And um, yeah, so it's not going to be a very technical discussion. I just wanted to share with you the beauty and the uniqueness of what I saw in Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. I will call it PIDW from now on. Um, so just to entice you to see what's there and to have a better appreciation of what this place is. So as um, Datu had mentioned just now, PIDW is one of the peat swamps or type of wetlands. Hang on, I'm trying to get, all right, it's slow connection of change. All right, so sorry for the <laughs> transition, it's very slow. Uh, so basically what you see here in the, in the colored picture, that is PIDW. And, and the way you see it, it's located, you know, it's situated in a much larger, what used to be a pit swamp forest. And it's one of the, um, one of the larger, other than Raja um pit swamp areas in Selangor. And as Dato had also mentioned, the areas of pit swamps are declining quite uh, rapidly over the last two decades. So PIDW, as you can see, is surrounded by areas that are, have already been um, going through some land use changes. There's some mining going on. There's some development going on. Um, and so eventually, PIDW will be kind of like a island, a forest island in the middle of other land uses. But not to not to, to fret. I mean, PIDW in itself is you know a pretty large area of 450 hectares. That's quite big, and it contains 11 lakes within that system. I'll just share with you. Um, I'm sorry, May, but something's not working with the slides. It's not chance. Okay. Um, so oh, let me just go back. What most people know about PIDW or Paya Inda before this were basically to go and see these two hippos that, well, if you don't already know, they're not native species, so they were gifts from Botswana. And of course, they were they started off some captive breeding. I would say it was an active captive breeding, but it was meant to keep a few crocodiles, which have now escalated to a population of 60, more than 60 crocodiles. And they're all located in a very safe guarded area in Paya Inda. But beyond that, there's not much that um, people are very aware of what is in Paya Inda unless you have spent considerable time in there. And what I wanted to share with you, what is so unique about um, PIDW is the fact that it consists of both terrestrial and aquatic habitats. And because of these two um, very different um, habitats, 
you're bound to get different animals as well. Different animals, both aquatic, like fish, um, and, and mind you, as what Dr. had mentioned just now, the the um, aquatic what aquatic life in peat swamp forest is very very unique. So it can also be considered as endemic, meaning to say you might not find it in any other um, water systems. And of course, you've got this tracks of forest areas of land, terrestrial forest, that can also support a different kind of a group of wildlife. So as I mentioned, um, Paya Inda has some pretty good vegetation in the area. A lot of it is actually remnants of planting projects from you know, the last two decades. So you've got a mixture of um, natural vegetation, but majority of it is planted forest. And um, some of the planting programs that happened in the last two decades were, you know, um, fruit trees, um, bamboo, but there's also an overcrowded and dominance of acacia trees. So if some of you are not familiar with acacia, they tend to grow and, and populate very, very quickly. They're very fast growing and invasive species. So unfortunately, there's a lot of parts of, of um, Paya Inda that is covered with acacia trees, but still, those are habitats for some of the um, species that I'll be sharing with you soon. So for example, when and if you get a chance to go there, there's this whole row of fruit trees at campsite itself. And this is where you can see a lot of um, um, active um, wildlife in the daytime, most especially birds and insects. Um, I can go to the next slide, May. Right. Thank you. Um, and then the picture on the left is the one I mentioned about the planting of bamboo. So there's quite a number of um, bamboo species, bamboo experiment that was done um, probably 10 years ago. But it has accumulated to this beautiful kind of like Japanese garden kind. There's also, you know, in total, there's about 120 species of trees throughout PIDW and 40 plants. So these are some of the more, um, the picture on the right is, is a eucalyptus tree. It's not a native species tree, but um, it, it, it has generated into a beautiful landscape. So you, you, you're kind of like getting this different kind of habitats, different kind of vegetation. Some of it can be very Instagrammable. Um, when you're there. And then the picture on the left, I'm just bringing up this picture of a gelam tree because it's a very unique tree. It, it can survive very well in the water. And sometimes they call it gelam because in the nighttime, it does look a little bit eerie of if you, if you look at how the trees are bent over and things like that, and this looks really skinny and scrawny. So in the backlight, it looks a little bit gloomy, but it's a very unique tree vegetation. And you have also other 40 plants of uh, 40 species of plants and plants are very important these are shrubs these are grasses and ferns and these are very good food resources for wildlife um next so as i mentioned because of the variety of um of of habitats that are, are available in Paya Inda, it is supporting a very good and healthy um, variety of animals as well. So while we did the biodiversity survey last year, we encountered 156 wildlife species. And of that, 137 species, that means more than 80% of them are birds. Basically, that is what was the attraction of Paya Inda from two decades ago, other than the, um, the um, aquatic system. So it, it brought in a lot of birders, and as also Dr. mentioned, this is also one of the stopping area for migratory birds. And up till now, up to this day, the wildlife department who is um, who is managing this area, we're doing counts of migratory birds that come in towards the end of the year. It's usually from September till the following April. So I'm going to share with you some of the pictures of the wildlife that we managed to take during the biodiversity survey. Right, so some of the um, species that you will see are very common, uh, for example, like kingfishers. And of course, you, you'll be seeing some of the water birds like the yellow bittern and of the egrets. Um, but there are some of the other species, although they are common, but they are quite beautiful, for example, like the black nip oriole or even the, the bee eaters. And these are very, um, I would say, birds that you would most likely see on a regular basis on a day-to-day -day kind of visit. 
but there are also other um, other species. Surely, I'm really like to apologize, but yeah, the, the transitions are going very, very slow with slides. I apologize for that. But there are also other species that are not so common and which is what makes it very exciting to go there because this is kind of like a treasure hunt kind of feeling. For example, like the picture on the left, it's called the common kingfisher, but don't be fooled by the name because it's not very common. So if you are a bird or a naturalist, you would know that to spot one of this is kind of like, a, you know, it's a great excitement. Or the top picture, the top on the right, is a, is a beautiful um, broad bill. And the colors itself is so radiant and just being able to see them in the trees and to be able to capture a good picture of them, you know, that's, that's kind of like a very fulfilling um, feeling. And then you've got the bee eaters and the bottom right, if you do get a chance to spend, you know, some time at night, these are night jars and they're, they're very, very calm birds and they just sit in the middle of a road at night and they make this really nice cooing sound as well at night. Sometimes it sounds a little bit eerie, but it's just beautiful to be able to capture a picture of this bird at night because it doesn't move anywhere. It's a perfect model for nighttime shoots. Um, the next slide. So in the daytime also, those were mostly the bird pictures or the birds that you'll see. But in the daytime, so you've got animals that are up, on the, up in the trees, but you also got those that are on the ground. So the more common ones are the top pictures, the squirrel, and the bottom is the tree shrew. And you would normally see this in most urban settings. This is a very interesting one. Um, for some of you, this might be a very, um, it's quite a regular sighting, the dusky leaf monkey, or we call it the lotong. Um, it might seem common to some of us. Um, you would find them in small groups and they're normally actually also solitary. They will grow, in, I mean, they would move around in the trees. They don't, they don't go down to the ground very much. They like to stay, they're very shy animals, unlike the macaques. So they're very shy animals, um, but lately their, their level of um, risk for extinction has increased, meaning to say that the population has declined quite a bit. And now they are considered as vulnerable species, vulnerable to extinction. Sorry, from vulnerable, most recently they are now under the threatened category. So that is quite alarming. And in PIDW, they do have a number of these animals in their um, trees. And these are, sh I'm going to share with you some pictures from the camera traps that we had put up there. Um, so the wild pigs are very common. I think they're very common in a lot of the urban settings, especially areas that are edges into forest areas. So these are some night shots of the, um, the wild pigs. You also encounter them sometimes in the daytime. They don't attack, but uh, it's just kind of nice to see them scurrying around with the little ones. The picture on the top right is a little bit blur. Um, it's very hard to capture. This picture is a leopard cat. And leopard cats are considered semi-common. Um, they're more common in like um, mixed plantation areas. Um, but there's a, a few number of species of uh, number of individuals in Paya Inda. But you'll only be able to see them at night. The bottom picture on the right, again, is a very blur, but you, there's actually two individuals of um, the Malayan porcupine. So these are animals that, um, which, sorry, the picture on the bottom left is the, um, the monitor lizard. So these are the kind of animals that are in the background of this whole environment. It's just that we might not be able to see it. I mean, don't expect to see them when you go to Paya Inda, but they're definitely in the background. Some will come out at night when you're not aware. Um, next. So basically, um, I think maybe if you're controlling this, can you just press enter? Um, so just to recapture where all these animals were spotted throughout the Paya in the um, Discovery Wetlands. So if you look at the legend, the, from where you start off, which is the top right, that's the main entrance of Paya Inda itself. That's the more common area where the reception is and where there's the office and education center. That's where it's very lively to spot birds. So some of the pictures of birds that I had shown you is where you can capture around these areas and it's very accessible. Where else um, for the frogs, of course, it's a nocturnal animal. So you would have to be there till late evening if you would like to hear them. But you can hear them calling very, very clearly around the pond areas. And of course, these lakes would have the crocodiles. Um, so although the 60 crocodiles are meant to be in one cage captive area, but there are a couple we are still unsure whether they are wild or they have, were escapees from, from the refuge, but there are a few that were spotted, um, but I do believe that the wildlife department have them under control and it, they are patrolling the area continuously to make sure the safety of the visitors. 
And lastly, the mammal pictures that I had shown you, those are found in more vegetation, more dense vegetation areas. So these are the areas that are not really open to public, which is in a way is good because um, these animals are quite shy and they do need to have that kind of level of protection. Um, next. So in totality, there's about 275 species throughout PIDW of, of both mammals, um, frogs, reptiles, and birds. And of that, 187 of them are considered as protected species under our Wildlife Conservation Act. And 14 species are already under the threatened um, classification under the International Union for Nature Conservation. So this kind of like, um, uh, we're just, how would I say, this demonstrates the importance of PIDW and the work that has been going on there for the last two decades and until now, the continuous conservation, continuous awareness, continuous protection of the area for these animals and for the habitat that is considered as a um, unique animal. So we are, it's, it's, a, it's one of our last remaining pit swamps and there's not much left in Selangor area. Um, so next. So I think the only way that you can best enjoy this is really to go to PIDW, experience it for yourself. If you're an avid photographer, you're an avid birder, this is a very good place for you. But also if you're just about to learn about the ecosystem, to learn about um, insects, insects are a beautiful start to learning about ecology and how the environment in, in, interacts with us. I would suggest that, you know, take, take a walk. I would say take a walk on the wild side you know, um, come out of your comforts and um, take a walk in the peat swamp in Paya Inda. And the next presentation will be sharing you how you can basically experience this in various ways. And so I think with that, I would like to end my presentation. Uh, this is a picture taken at sunset at Paya Inda. So it's both beautiful, both day and night. And I do hope to see you guys there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christine, for showing us this rich flora and fauna biodiversity found within Fire in the Discovery Wetlands. This presentation is actually very meaningful to all of us because it shows that wildlife can actually live harmonious with us and they live actually around us as well and very close to us. So for those bird lovers yeah, and also nature lovers, you, are, you're, you can definitely visit PIDW, Fire in the uh, Discovery Wetlands and carry out this activity. So thank you very much again, Dr. Christine. Um, for those who just joined us, uh, I would like to welcome you and also uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as a reminder, please switch off your mic and also to uh, switch off your web camera. Then if you have any question, please use the chat box function to ask your questions. And do stay with us because after the presentation session, we will have a quiz session where the participants may stand a chance to win four tickets to Fire in the Discovery Wetlands. Now, let's, I would like to introduce our third speaker of the day, Ms. Li Po Feng. So, Ms. Li is currently uh, leading the marketing for Fire in the Discovery Wetlands. With the rich content in Fire in the Discovery Wetlands, coupled with the fast paced uh, digital marketing in place, she is passionate to curate a good story and entice more visitors to witness the beauty of wetlands. After graduating from University of Melbourne, she started as a management consultant learning different industry trades. She then shifted into leisure and hospitality industry since year 2011, where she involved in major projects for tourism destination. She is also passionate about storytelling, and she has authored a few children's books published by the MBH and also Oxford University Press. Ms. Lee, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Hoi Ming. Can you hear? Yes. And thank yeah, you, Dr. Kaysro and Dr. Christine for a very informative session on wetlands and also the biodiversity in uh, Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. So this session is actually more about uh, what is inside Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands and what you can do in Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. A brief introduction, um, PIDW, uh, Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands is 1,111 acres of lush green and lakes. As you saw uh, Dr. Christine's uh, vast lakes, uh, around 11 of them. Um, the activities that we try to, uh, that we promote here, uh, we position ourselves as an ecotourism hub within the Klang Valley. 
we introduced conservation programs and also education programs to start from young, of course, uh, to look after the mother nature, right? Mother Earth uh, and to educate them that this is important to uh, protect the ecosystem, not just in wetlands, but um, everywhere else. Okay, let me just go here. Uh, so for this is actually just more about um, how to get here in Paya Indah Discovery Wetlands. We are strategically located. Uh, it's nearer now to uh, KL and PJ within the 30 minute drive. This new entrance via the exit of Gamuda Cove Interchange is exit 607A. Um, by drive is actually 30 minutes and also if you have the time after that, you know, uh, Midsway Outlet is just 15 minutes away. Okay, just to share with you, uh, Paya Indah Discovery Wetlands, these are our tenants. As we've heard from the start, it's always about protect and restore. Uh, the third one we have is actually explore. Now due to global warming and also many of the industry development, um, of course, it is important that we uh, protect and restore the surrounding in wetlands. And we do this by introducing like conservation programs with like tree planting, CSR programs. Uh, we want to plant more fruit trees so that the birds can uh, stay, the migratory birds can come, right? And we can improve the biodiversity in wetlands. The last one on the exploration, we introduce activities that are more eco-friendly. We want to have, um, these are the type of activities that are currently in Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. The first tree is actually currently ongoing. Safari Insta Tour, right? Jungle School Program and also Animal Feeding. What's coming soon is in September, very, very soon, is actually Boat Cruise, Hot Air Balloon, and also our newest attraction, which is the tram ride. We're currently testing it out. So uh, it's gonna be quite fun. Um, the highlight here, of course, um, in, is our hot air balloon where, because it's such a vast area, to be able to have a bird's eye view, um, this is actually perfect. Uh, this teethed hot air balloon is actually uh, by a chartered session. So it will be good if you want to have like a team building activity or a corporate activity. And uh, for the individuals, uh, perhaps a nice spot to propose or even some wedding anniversary. Uh, activities there that you can have, right? Okay, I'm, good. I'm going to go into details about what we currently have. And these are actually the spots during our 45 minute tour of the Insta Tour ride. Very beautiful, as you can see um, on the right, uh, these are two pictures taken by photographers. Uh, bottom right, uh, it's actually an actual picture by one of our uh, Pahilitan uh, colleague. His name is Inchat Rosag and he has um, very uh, generously shared this picture with me. Uh, it's taken during a sunset. And then on the left is the bamboo trail and also the Rumah Melayu. Now during the tour, you will have a ranger guide who will bring you through the historical and also the wetlands ecosystem education uh, program that will bring you, you know, um, learn that you will learn about biodiversity when you're actually traveling here and taking all the Insta, Insta uh, with these pictures. Okay, this is currently also ongoing. We are actually doing a very good um, uh, sessions here since July. We introduced this jungle school and this program has been curated by Kitsi. Uh, what we actually have is uh, on the left, on the top left here, top left, we do a safety briefing session first, right? And then later on, after about, about five minutes to 10 minutes, they go on a very adventurous safari ride. Now during the safari ride, what we are actually doing to uh, introduce wetlands is to um, educate them on the ecosystem. What are the lakes for? and uh, what are the trees to actually protect the uh, flora and, and the fauna. And uh, also a little bit of a hide and seek game. As you can see, there are more wildlife um, in Dr. Christine's presentation earlier. We have the lutong, the squirrels, the monitor lizard. So they do come out, you just have to seek them during the day. 
Now, the, the rest of it, I can assure you, you will definitely see that you will miss it. Uh, we have three hippos. Uh, of course, two are actually the babies. Um, They're called Baby and Lily. And then we have the crocodiles, the 60 crocodiles that are also in an enclosure. We, every weekend, we do have an animal feeding session. And uh, on the left here, uh, bottom left, is actually the terrapins and the Malayan porcupines. We have 10 different species, from yellow tortoise to turtles to uh, and terrapins, small little terrapins that you can actually see. There are many, many of them there. And the Malayan porcupines, I think we have about 10. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually during a weekend that you can see the animal feeding. So please come over uh, to join the Jungle School program. It's very entertaining, very educational, and also very adventurous for kids. Um, not only is this a bird sanctuary, as we know there are over 200 species of birds there, uh, but there's also these tiny creatures that we want to uh, you know, explore, that when you discover and you walk, you discover quite a lot of these tiny creatures and uh, you'll be amazed from uh, within a 10 uh, uh, minute, you will find like maybe 10 different species of dragonflies quite easily in Pioneer Discovery Wetlands. And from Dato Kezro's uh, explanation earlier, it is only there when it's really clean. And so we know that Paya Inner Discovery Wetlands is really clean and is uh, untouched, right? We try to protect and restore as, as we are speaking here. Okay. At the end of this year, uh, we will introduce more leisure activities. Of course, there is actually the birders uh, coming over already, but this will be a guided bird watching and uh, guided photography session. We will have fishing and also leisure cycling um, coming up soon. And these are for those who want to break out a bit of sweat, a more adventurous type. We have two trails, um, the horse riding trail and also, and also the adventure cycling trail. Both trails are about uh, four to five kilometers and they actually go around um, the wetlands, uh, two different trails to enjoy the scenic lakes and also the uh, tree surrounding, right? Okay, the last one here, uh, last but not least, uh, we are actually working together with NGOs to promote um, biodiversity by introducing tree planting program. So we kickstart the CSF program with the tree planting. There will be more, um, whether it's volunteering or other CSR programs, but um, taken from the biodiversity report that we uh, recently did with uh, Dr. Christine, uh, we want to introduce more fruit trees and to plant in Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. Um, so we work together with uh, the Pahilitan uh, crew, you know, find out where is the perfect location and also work together with NGOs, um, get more volunteers, and then we will approach the corporates. And if you are in a corporate or um, if, you are uh, if you are interested to do any team building activities, please do uh, drop us a note. Uh, currently, because of the COVID situation, we do want to limit it to around 40 to 50 packs, uh, just to main, make sure that it's all safe, yeah? Um, okay, very much, that's it. I think, thank you so much. This is our social media handler. Please follow us. And if you have a question or want to know more about the availability of the sessions, drop us a WhatsApp. Uh, it's easier, then we can let you know. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bofeng, uh, for this very, for introducing this beautiful wetlands landscape in the Baya Inda Discovery Wetlands. And also the exciting recreation activities that we can be carry out with our, uh, our family members and friends. We do look forward to those adventurous activity which will be open soon. Okay, thank you very much again for joining us today. So now we have come to a question and answer session. Uh, due to the time constraint, I will now select a few questions and direct them to our speakers. So I would like to remind you again that if you still have more uh, questions, just please use the chat box function to post your question. We will compile and answer those questions which are not answered during the the question and answer session. We will then share this with you in a fact sheet format at a later time. 
So you can still continue uh, as your as your post your question using the chat box. So we will answer we will answer and share that fact sheet later. Now I have the first question, which is direct to uh, Dato Kezu. So Miss Ida, she is uh, she's wondering how is tsunami a threat to wetlands, but at the same time also protect us from tsunami. Thank you, May, and thank you, Aida. You have been very observant to note that I put tsunami as a threat as well as, as a benefit. Um, in actual fact, they are both. You know, the wetlands are in the front line because they are at the coastline. And this is where the tsunami wave would hit land. So, because they are at the front line, they bear the full force of the tsunami. And sometimes the tsunami is so strong, like the one in Aceh, that it will wipe out a whole forest of mangroves or wetland plants. But in the process of uh, facing the full force, they actually dis dissipate most of the force so that after the tsunami wave has hit the forest, then it has very little energy left. And when it reaches the hinterland, it has become a, a very weak wave. So tsunamis are both a threat to wetlands and at the same time, it protects the hinterland from the full force of the tsunami. So you could say, the wetlands sacrifice themselves to protect us. And therefore, after the tsunami, I think we do have an obligation to go and replant it back. And also for our own protection, it's good to replant, to reforest back the wetlands. So I hope uh, that will uh, answer your concerns, Aida. Okay. Thank you very much, Dato. So we actually learned that Tsunami, yes, it's not only a, a threat to the to the mangrove, but actually tsunami. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm saying the wrong thing. Actually, mangrove are protecting us <laughs> from the storm. So yeah, we do we do uh, we should appreciate these uh, ecosystem services that we do not see it that often. Okay, now I have a second que uh, second question from J W. This question is actually posted uh, to Dr. Christine. Um, the, part the participant is actually interested uh, in one of the birds that Dr. Christine explained earlier, the night jar. So uh, apparently this night jar has a habit of staying on the land. So the participant is concerned if this night jar will become a victim of poachers if they portray such a habit. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, thank you very much, JW, for that question. It's a very valid question. Um, so fortunately for night jars, it's not um, a species that is sought after by poachers, mainly because they're very plain looking and, you know, they're not like a sing-song kind of bird. So it's not an attractive um, trophy for, for poachers. So in, that is one of the reasons why they are pretty safe in Paya Inda. But also, um, the second thing is that, you know, since Paya Inda is a protected area, I mean, it's managed by the wildlife department. So um, the area itself is cordoned off and the wildlife department should be able to control people from coming in and, you know, poaching. So in Paya Inda, it's safe, but outside, despite its behavior and sitting quietly and being very exposed, they are pretty safe from poachers because of their less attractiveness. Yeah, so pretty much that. So just to put in note, for example, another animal that has a very um, exposing kind of behavior are like the flying foxes. So if you notice, flying foxes are always hanging on, you know, on, very, on, on trees that are bare of leaves. So it's very exposed, very obvious, and that makes them very easy target for poachers. So yes, but because bats are, you know, flying foxes are a game game species. So that one is a threat. <laughs> I see. Thank you, Dr. Christine, for answering the question. Now I have um, one question for Miss Lee. Actually, I have several questions. So since like, there are a lot of participants who are very interested on the Paya Inda Discovery Wetlands. So now I have Miss Tiffany. 
So she is asking what is the minimum age for children to join the jungle school? And uh, also, I think this question is quite relevant to you as well, where um, Miss Nuru Shakira, so she is asking if university students can do a research study there. So, uh, Miss Lee? Yeah, okay. So I'll answer uh, Tiffany, young Tiffany's question first. Basically, the Jungle School program is from two to three years old up to about nine or ten. So uh, it's a bit of walking. So if you like to do um, more of the animal trail, you know, to discover, that will be very good. Uh, and we will have more programs also for uh, older kids coming up soon uh, to learn a bit more of the scientific uh, um, uh, programs about wetlands. Yeah, but currently it's the animal trail. So from two to about nine. Yes. And then from Nuru Shakila, right? about uh, the research. Yes, I think uh, we can work out with um, university students. We very much want to encourage education in this uh, category for our research and development. So uh, it'll be good. Drop us a note and we will actually come back to you. Okay. 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 Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Lee, uh, for, being, thank you. for answering the, the question. Um, now we are, okay, I understand that because due to the time constraint, we are unable to answer all questions, but um, rest assured because uh, those unanswered questions, we will collect and compile them in a fact sheet. We will come back to you uh, in a fact sheet format. Uh, we will email those fact sheets to you. So no worries. Um, now we are actually come to the last session, which is our quiz session. So for this quiz session, um, let me read out some of the rules where first one, um, we have five questions that are related to the topic presented just now. So uh, we will ask this question, then um, for your information, there are five sets of tickets to buy in the Discovery Wetlands will be given to the winner. So meaning each question will have a winner. Participants should use the chat box function to answer the question. And also, participants who answer the question correctly within the shortest time will be chosen as the winner. So, two important things to remember. Use the chat box function. Secondly, you will answer it correctly and in the shortest time. Yeah? Now, um, our officer will actually assess the chat box during the session and then they will determine the, the winner. Now, I would like to go to the first question. So, participants, please be ready. First question, name two benefits of wetlands to the, to the society. First question, name two benefits of wetlands to the society. Okay, thank you for answering. Second question, please name one thing you can do to save the wetlands. Second question, name one thing you can do to save the wetlands. Okay, now I will go to the third question. Name three common birds found in fire in the discovery wetlands. So please name three common birds found in fire in the discovery wetlands. Okay, ready? So now come to the fourth question. Fourth question is, what are PIDW tenants? What are PIDW tenants? So I hope you can still remember what are the three tenants of uh, Fire Inda Discovery Wetlands. Oh, I have give, given out a hint. <laughs> All right, now, Come to the last questions. Please name three activities or attractions found in Baya Inda Discovery Wetlands. Please name three activities and, and attractions found in Baya Inda Discovery Wetlands.
So participants, please, yeah, join us. Okay. Now, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we will actually announce the winner. Um, yes, please, please hold on because my, yeah, my officer, they are assessing and then they are assessing who are the winner to each question. Thank you very much for your participation and also stay with us until the end of this webinar. Uh, so we hope that you have learned something and then you have also enjoyed this webinar and also uh, actively take part in this webinar by answering the quest, uh, by answering the quiz. Okay, now I will uh, announce the winner. Okay, now um, our first Winner to our, our, our winner to the first question is Inche Norman. Okay, Inche Norman. Um, actually, our organizer, uh, officer from uh, Fire Inda Discovery Wetlands, they will contact you soon to get your uh, to inform you how to redeem the ticket to the Fire Inda Discovery Wetlands. Okay, now our second winner, uh, to the question number two is. Miss Lee Yi Ling. It's Miss Lee Yi Ling. So congratulations. So and then followed by the our third winner. Our third winner is Miss Ida. Miss Ida, you have answered our third questions correctly. Congratulations. Then um, our fourth, our fourth winner today is Miss Elaine. Miss Elaine. Congratulations. So, and then our last winner, our last winner is, oh, we have, we have a winner who actually, who actually win, yeah, won, won the prize twice. Okay. So, congratulations again, uh, Mr. Norman. Uh, yeah, you have answered the question correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. And then, uh, and congratulations. Congratulations to the winners. So again, our officer from Fire India Discovery Wetland will contact you soon and uh, to let you know what, uh, how to redeem the ticket. But meanwhile, our officer will also um, reach you privately and then to get your information. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. May, may. Also, please tell them we'll put this onto YouTube. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dato, for reminding me. Uh, yes, so for your information, this webinar is recorded and then uh, we will circulate the link to the YouTube. We will upload this recorded webinar to the YouTube. So we will then share the link to YouTube with all of you at a later time. So you can, you can yes, you can access the link and then we watch, uh, and watch this again. Or feel free to share with your friends and family. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dato. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Thank you, Ms. Lee, uh, for being for this Thank you, Hai Mei. Presentation. And everyone and, here. Okay. Thank you. Thank Hope you. Hope you have a great day.